Okay. All right. Thanks everyone for uh, coming to today's panel. Um, we've got a, a great group of panelists here. We're going to be looking at uh, building uh, Alberta's innovation ecosystem. It's a bit of a, a common theme that we've seen through a few of the different panels and sessions here uh, at COP so far, but I think it's an important one. And uh, we've got, uh, I think the right, the right people here on the panel today to look at not just what are the pieces of that ecosystem, but how, how that ecosystem is helping uh, companies build toolkits and implement some of those toolkits. So we look into you guys at the end to maybe share some of the, the pieces that uh, the ecosystem has produced and, and how it's being implemented to actually make some uh, an impact in, in organizations. So looking forward to, to that. Um, but for introductions, I'm going to, uh, I'll say who's on the panel, but then I'll, I'll kick it over to you guys to just give a quick sort of uh, overview of, of, of who you are and who your organization is and, and sort of what your role in the ecosystem is as just like uh, a real quick intro. Um, now, we didn't sit down in, in the order that everybody's on my sheet, but I think I can figure this one out. <laughs> so uh, Justin Reamer is Chief Executive Officer of Emissions Reduction Alberta. Uh, Sherry Wilson is Deputy Minister of Environment Protected Areas from the Government of Alberta. Uh, Yvonne Champagne is uh, Founder and Chief Carbon Officer of Carbon AI. And uh, Scott Volk is Director of Emissions and Innovation at, at Termlane. Uh, and I'm Tim Shaw, Manager of Public Affairs at Termlane. I often forget to introduce myself. So, uh, Justin, maybe we'll turn it over to you. We'll just work our way down the panel. A quick overview of uh, you, your organization, and uh, sort of where you fit in the, the ecosystem. I, uh, and thanks so much uh, for the invitation today, Tim, and I uh, appreciate being here to talk about Emissions Reduction Alberta and, and uh, more importantly, the innovation ecosystem we have in the province. So ERA, uh, as many of you know, um, been around for 15 years and funds de-risks late stage technologies uh, in the clean tech space, technologies that both reduce emissions and create economic opportunity for the province. And so uh, we fund in the neighborhood typically of, of a million to five million uh, on a grant basis to companies with a one-to-one -one private sector match required for projects. We've funded up to 10, 15 billion, million um, on a, a few exceptional projects, um, but we're really focused on getting those uh, last uh, stages of uh, bridging the valley virtualization of death that many companies experience and trying to get the companies you know, to commercial market scale. And that's the role we play. We work very closely with our other ecosystem partners in the province and uh, nationally and in order to achieve those goals. Uh, great, thanks. That uh, commercialization challenge is, is one that's often uh, unaddressed. So it's good to have a focus there as well. Oh, Deputy Minister. Hi, thanks, Tim. Uh, really happy to be here. My first COP, so this is a great experience. Uh, so I'm the Deputy Minister for Environment and Protected Areas in Alberta, and I would say that our department is responsible for actually setting the policy framework, um, as well as doing some significant investment, uh, working with ERA as one of our uh, as one of their funders, um, to actually advance uh, some of the the innovation that actually happens across the province. Uh, but we're also responsible, as I said, for the policy framework. So that would include the regulatory approach as well. And I'll talk a little bit later about our tier system, which is our carbon pricing and emission reduction system. So we we are the uh, implementers uh, and the regulators of that system. Uh, great. Um, one of the things I was mentioning uh, before the panel kicked off is the Team Alberta approach that the government often implements. And you kind of see it here throughout COP and you see it at other conferences. But uh, Alberta government does such a great job of organizing uh, you know, people from the province and companies from the province to coordinate it at events like COP like this. So that's a, a appreciated part of what the government does as well. See that in action. We're happy to do it. Yeah. We want to promote Alberta as much as we can. Yeah, love it. Yvonne. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, again, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and uh, participate in this panel. Um, so Carbon AI, we're, we're really proud to be um, have our global headquarters based in Calgary. So we're really proud of that. So we as a company, how we play in the ecosystem is two things. Uh, so first, we're a software development company. So we developed a number of tools and applications to better manage and measure not only greenhouse gas emission reductions, but all sorts of environmental attribute or other environmental attribute of those. Could be things like the fuel standard credits, anything that's really driving to some form of environmental product. Um, the second way that we participate is by developing large-scale greenhouse gas uh, reduction projects and programs. Um, yeah. So. Great. Thanks. 
Scott. Okay. My name is Scott Folk. I'm the Director of Emissions and Innovation at Termaline. Uh, for people that don't know Termaline, we're Canada's largest natural gas producer. We're quite focused on, on production and owning our own assets as well. So we're the fourth largest midstream company in Canada. Uh, we've been focused on environmental performance for some time. Uh, for Termaline, that means kind of all aspects of environmental performance, and hopefully we'll talk about a number of them today. So that, that would be air, like GHG emissions, land as far as land use and things along that side, and, and water as well. So that, that's something that, that we bring to the table here that we believe we're quite environmentally focused and forward-thinking company that's focused on being a strong Alberta producer at the same time as being environmentally responsible. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I um, appreciate you taking the time for the, the panel today. Uh, we'll kick off our first question. Uh, look at the Deputy Minister Sherry there. Um, and you mentioned some of the, the pieces of what, of what um, EPA does in terms of uh, being an enabler and a regulator uh, from the government perspective. But what is it that makes Alberta such a hub for innovation? And, uh, and why is this really a priority for the province? Yeah, so maybe I mean, the first comment I would make is that I think Alberta actually has a long history in being an energy leader. Uh, we see it across the board in industry as well as with government. But I think that there, I mentioned the um, emissions, carbon pricing and emission reduction system that we have, which we call tier today. Um, and there's several components of that. But but I, I would say that from an innovation hub perspective, I think what makes us so attractive and why we're so good at what we do is three really big components. One is partnership, working with post-secondary researchers, working with industry, and as a regulator, uh, we come together to actually think about what our goals and our targets need to be and do that together. Um, the second thing is actually having a policy framework that works well. So it would include our regulation, uh, market-based analysis and incentives, um, as well as offering the flexibility to encourage the investment from and the uptake and in ingenuity that we would need from industry as our experts that can offer that innovation and the technology. The third piece is really the investment side of things. Um, Justin talked a little bit about what they do and we're part of that. We do the investment side of it. We see industry as the experts in this, but we really wanna do the policy side and we really wanna provide that funding to spark and spur that innovation uh, and support that, um, that new technology moving forward. And I think it helps to keep the, uh, the industry uh, competitive across the world. Um, I would say from a priority, why is it a priority for us? Um, I think that we need innovation to, to drive uh, competitiveness and actually to evolve over time. We need it for both emissions reduction, but we also need it to increase our production, which is what we really want to see in Alberta. Um, I, I, I think I've heard before, I think everybody sees it across the world, energy demands are increasing, which means uh, we need to continue to do that in Alberta, our economy relies on that energy production. And I and it's why Al Alberta is an energy leader. We've, I, I mentioned we've had our carbon pricing system in place for nearly 20 years. Um, we were an early adopter for carbon capture, utilization and storage. In fact, we have some of the largest projects in the world. Um, and we've seen uh, our methane reductions actually happen earlier. So I think we hit our 45% target three years earlier. We're actually even above that now. I think we're at 52%. And, and, and we've made investments, millions of dollars in methane emissions reduction. And we're seeing overall reductions across the board. So I, I think that what you'll find is that that's a priority for us. We're going to continue that priority um, and that focus on in, in innovation and technology and continuing to work with industry. Yeah, great. Uh, so I'll say to the other panelists, feel free to jump in on any of these questions, even if it's directed to someone. If you want to build, feel free. Um, I agree. Alberta's always had that pioneering spirit. It's uh, if there's a problem, let's find a solution and, and keep on building. And uh, we, we see it that some of the solutions that came from that attitude and in, in the policy frameworks that you were just mentioning. And um, so I, I'm hoping that you guys at the end there will talk about how some of those policy, policy frameworks have kicked off some of the innovations, um, you know, that that you guys are, are using in your organizations every day. Uh, I know, Scott, you're part of our uh, at Termaly and our, our methane efforts um, really spun out of early uh, Tier initiatives. Maybe can you explain a little bit about how how we took a first step uh, from that framework? Yeah, so I, I'm sure most people in the audience have a bit of an idea of what tier is, but a tier is our uh, industrial carbon pricing uh, system in Alberta, and it's unique to many in that it has both the carrot and a stick approach. So there there's a, essentially a cost to to having 
behavior that would be considered bad, and there's a reward for a behavior that would be considered good. And and that system really worked really well for Termlean to to be able to really to use the system and use the tools and use the entire ecosystem that you see across the stage here in order to make a really meaningful impact on our emissions reduction. And, and one of probably the biggest examples of that would be the methane space. Alberta really put a bounty on methane. Like they, they not only made it difficult or costly to emit methane, but they made it that if you could find a way to reduce methane emissions, that there really was an opportunity in order to, to get rewards or discount on your on your tier compliance obligations. So that bounty on methane drove huge amounts of innovation. Uh, it drove producers like us at, at Termline to find new ways to reduce methane emissions and look at our systems and along those things. And it drove huge amounts of technology development across the whole sector. Like the things that didn't exist before before that offset program were just incredible. There, there wasn't air solutions. There wasn't very many electric solutions. There, there weren't all these technologies to detect methane. Like now Canada has satellites in space. We have aircraft that can find your barbecue on lit. We have continuous monitors that can, can find the, the parts per million. And that bounty on methane really drove all that. And what, what I've seen kind of from the past is that it also drove these kind of really interesting things. Like there, there used to be these concepts of incubators. Ivan was part of them at one, one point in time. And, and these companies would say, yes, there's this bounty on methane. We want to help you take advantage of it. And, and they were helping all sizes of companies and all sizes of, of innovators to truly try to find ways to really work with the Alberta government to find ways to reduce methane emissions. Yeah, great. I, I mean, one of the building blocks of an ecosystem is going to be supports like that from a policy perspective that also enables uh, the, the funding to flow to initiatives like you were just describing there, Scott. Now, maybe coming back to script and back to the, the funding side of things. <laughs> um, so, Justin, over to you. So, uh, you mentioned some of the things that that ERA does and that commercialization sort of uh, gap that that often shows up in, in some of these, these systems. But a uh, core to advancing innovation is making sure that that innovators and innovation has access to the resources that they need to, to really succeed. So maybe tell us a bit more about ERA's role in, in enabling that and providing those resources with what they are. Sure. So just like it takes a, a village to raise a child, it takes a village to, to raise a technology and see that commercialized. And uh, in Alberta, we have such a fantastic community of supports uh, gathered around a lot of these innovators that you don't quite see in other jurisdictions. There's trying to pinpoint why actually is that happening um uh, i was talking to some colleagues in ontario and they were saying you folks in alberta aren't afraid to try things and you work collaboratively there's a lot of silos in other large jurisdictions where they're all trying to do their own thing and it's a bit dog eat dog type of approach we have a real community sense in 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 the province um in calgary in particular i really note this community of um uh, high level executives in the oil and gas industry who are giving back and helping emerging innovators with mentorship and guidance and, and supports. Um, there's a variety of problem solving innovation ecosystem um, solution providers and leaders uh, like uh, CRIN and natural uh, NGIF, uh, Natural Gas Innovation Fund, um, ourselves, Alberta Innovates. And, and in the past, we've probably been a little bit more competitive with one another. And I think you've seen a, a change of heart and change of direction in the past little while we're working much more together we're, we're better together and we're supporting one another to reach the end goal of actually supporting the companies that need to deliver on the technologies uh to solve the world's problems whether they be large industrial companies or whether they be these small uh innovation uh, companies so you know our funding is a big part of what we are but it's not all of what we are it's it's a, a, a an instrumental part that gets companies interested in wanting to talk to us and apply for our funding and, and see that uh, grant support that will then enable them to unlock uh financing that is almost impossible to raise otherwise without some level of grant support because our you know we have such a conservative financial institution structure in in the country where uh, it's really hard to fund first in kind deployment but it's also we're, we're also starting to get more into facilitating mentorship and and guidance not just the money it's the uh talent and skill development that uh we can provide most small medium-sized companies don't have all the requisite talent they need in order to take a com uh, uh, technology from here to there and commercialize and so we're, we're enabling more supports there's a lot of business incubator supports in calgary and elsewhere in the province that uh we're, we're contributing to um, the knowledge sharing 
is, is so important. So every company doesn't have to try the same thing over and over again and or uh, uh, in isolation. And you can learn from one another's uh, mistakes and challenges as well as their successes. And so we put a lot of emphasis in that. And also then sharing those learnings with our, our policy developers and the Sherry's department and the Alberta government, the regulators and, and others so that they can have that intel to make forward thinking policies and legislation and, and regulatory regimes that are actually going to enable and not block or disenable new innovation. And I think that's one of the great things in Alberta. So across the board, you know, I sum it up as we're not afraid to try things. We, we actually do try stuff and often we fail and that's, that's innovation. But you know, it's not. It, it's only through that um, trying and that progression that you're going to see real success in, in, in achieving outcomes. So connect and share, and don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Keys to success. Right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm going to move down here to Yvonne, and um, I think this is a bit of an extension of maybe some of what what uh, Justin was just saying on the supports that ERA uh, provides, but. Uh, you're implementing technologies around the world, uh, but you have that headquarter in Calgary. So maybe could you uh, share a bit more about the Alberta connection and how you've benefited from some of these innovation ecosystems or how you've seen uh, ecosystems like this kind of kickstart some of those technologies that, that you're implementing uh, around the world? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise that Calgary is a, a global hub or a cluster for a lot of innovation that's happening around greenhouse gas mitigation and rules. And, you know, I think where that really starts, if I, if I think about what are the what are the keys to success about this cluster in Calgary, it comes down to a few things. One is a real entrepreneurial spirit that exists in the province of Alberta. You have a lot of people who've been able to take risk, take and risk everything, whether it be from a business standpoint, whether it be in agriculture, in the energy sector, who understands what, what people understand what it means to take a risk. And that mindset, that willingness to take a leap of faith is really, really important, especially in the patent space where we need to develop new technologies in certain cases. The second thing I would say is a mindset. So our official, on our, on, in our province, on our license plates and our vehicles, you know, I think it says, you know, wild rose country. But I think what it really should say is get her done, which I think is the unofficial motto of the province of Alberta, where people are just willing to get out there and do it. So we think about climate change. It's not a mission about just talking about stuff. It's a mission about getting stuff done. And so I think Calgary is a community. Alberta is a province where people actually do stuff, right? Part of that is willing to, willingness to take risks. The second is actually getting stuff done. So I think it's really part of our culture as a company is about getting stuff done. It is about taking risks. But more importantly, it's really, um, I think there's a confidence that comes with a community of people who've taken risks who know that, you know what, if we do this, take this risk, we can actually do this. So again, that can do spirit. Yeah, we can actually do this. So the combination of those things are really, really important in terms of, in terms of the people that we hire as a company, the spirit and the culture that we're trying to create. We're really proud to talk about Calgary as, as our global headquarters, because I think when we talk to people, whether they be in Nigeria or the Middle East or Dubai, people have an understanding that actually Calgary is one of those places that is about innovation, is about getting stuff done. So, yeah, hopefully that. that yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, you know, it, it reminds me, so that the get her done attitude uh, about implementing in, in, innovation um, really jumped out at me. Uh, earlier in the summer, we got, so the government of Alberta has funded uh, emissions testing center that we're part of a term, Termaline with NGIF and the University of Calgary. Um, and so we were making the announcement of, of that uh, funding at the emissions testing center. And it had been raining for a couple of days and this is at a, a gas plant just outside of Edson, Alberta. Um, so it's not the greatest roads getting out to it. And it was kind of drizzling. So it was pretty slick getting out there um, and damp the whole day. But one of the speakers there was saying, you know, this is a perfect example of where innovation happens. People think that it happens in boardrooms or in labs or wherever, but it happens with all of these things being implemented on the ground in the mud. It's where the work gets done. And I think that, you know, that is what Alberta does. It takes those innovations, it implements them, gets their fingernails dirty, but it also sees some success. 
So I think that's a yeah a great example of of that is uh, sort of what's behind some of this. So you know, Scott, maybe um, over to you in terms of how some of these innovations are being implemented. So how's Termaline using this? What does the toolkit look like that's spinning out of this ecosystem um, and you know from the the mud of the facilities where some of these things are testing? How how's that toolkit building and how are you seeing that come around? Yeah. So. Termaline tries to be an important part of the ecosystem and, and trying to be part of the solution. So I propose we try to use every tool available in Alberta. Uh, so kind of what I talked about early is, is that offset program. And to give an example of that early in 2019, like uh, really way before the world was necessarily thinking about methane the way we are today, we, we changed out 3,400 devices and, and that protocol reduced over 200,000 tons of emissions just from that that piece. So that that's kind of like a hard example of how you can use the, the protocol that exists in Alberta in order to reduce emissions. And then we've kind of used all the ecosystems. So I think NGF was mentioned here earlier. So we're, we're an active part of all branches of, of NGF. So that would be the emissions testing center where we're where we're doing the validation and the testing of clean tech technologies, many of which that were developed and homegrown in Alberta, but don't need to be. We, we're happy to test and validate all methane, uh, both detection and abatement technologies there. We're also part of NGF's venture space. So that would be in order to, when you find these companies that have kind of got a good technology and they're ready to go, but they're just having a real hard time finding capital in order to, to make that next step, we're part of that venture space. So we can we have capital going in there. And, and probably the early stage would be on the grant side. So early on, we're, we're partnered with, with groups like ERA and things like that in order to help fund some of these technologies when they're early on in their stages and, and really just new, do need non-dilutive capital in order to get a, a technology out and into the market. And that's something that Termaline funds as well. Uh, so, so we're a part of all those different pieces. And then sometimes we're actually a participant in some of the, or, the things as well. So with the emissions reduction, Alberta, we, we actually applied for a grant and we were working on a technology to kind of create a hybrid drilling rig. So like a battery pack kind of drilling rig runs like a Prius essentially on, on natural gas instead of diesel fuel. Cause that's been an important initiative to, to Termaline. We've, we've done a really, uh, Put a lot of effort into reducing emissions from diesel fuel. So, so that's kind of something where we're kind of using all the different pieces that were are across the stage here. We get you a get her done license plate for your Prius drilling rig. <laughs> um, so, I'm I'm from Calgary, but I uh, basically grew up in Ontario. And before I moved back to Calgary, I spent a bunch of time working with um, some of these sort of similar type of innovation ecosystem organizations in the greater Toronto area. So big tech focus, but looking to, you know, knowledge share, fund early stage startups and, and whatnot. Um, and so when I moved to Calgary, I was sort of looking for the same thing and, and it certainly exists. There's lots of innovation ecosystems uh, that are popping up and, and really maturing in Alberta. But the one that is grown around the energy industry is one of the stronger ones that I would have to say exists across Canada. There's just, there's so much to it. Um, so maybe Deputy Minister, we'll, we'll start with you, but then Scott, I'm gonna look to you to kind of come in behind uh, to complement this. But how do you see this ecosystem and these innovations helping further establish Alberta's leadership in terms of emissions reduction and uh, efficient operations? Yeah, I, I I would start by saying that we, we view innovation as being critical to advance, right? We see that not just in the energy sector, we see that everywhere. If you want to advance, you have to innovate. Um, but I also, if you want to see, stay competitive, you have to innovate. Um, and I think that what, what Alberta has is the right environment to actually do all of that, right? We, um, we want to work with our partners to make sure that the expertise that they have in industry, we can leverage when we're developing policy and we can create protocols uh, that can be supported and actually see that innovation and actually see the private sector invest in addition to what Alberta is able to do. Um, so I think th those are critical pieces. And maybe I'll just, um, I'll mention, because I think I've heard a lot about how um, we've invested in ERA or we invest through ERA. Um, but that's not the only place that Alberta is investing, right? Where NGIF was mentioned before, we've talked about uh, emissions testing center. Uh, we're looking at hydrogen. We're looking at um, uh, nuclear and geothermal. So we're actually expanding beyond. It's 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 all sectors of energy that I think we're looking at that makes um, makes it very critical for us to continue advancing. Yeah, yeah. I think Justin kind of said something earlier that that 
maybe the energy system is a little bit unique or a little bit odd in the fact that it's really collaborating and everyone's working together under one goal. And I think there's a little bit of a reason for that. And it, it's kind of like a rising tide raises all ships type of scenario. It, like we are all under one earth, so that that's kind of it, its own thing that, yeah, we've all got, got our own work to do to, to protect the planet. But I think it's bigger than that in that our energy systems and our, our energy companies realize that that environmental attributes are becoming more and more important and every everything we can do to have everyone improve their environmental attributes is a really good thing for Alberta and a really good thing for Canada as well. And then I, I think as we kind of keep talking about how we go the next steps and where the next steps are going, like you, you asked in the question, Tim, I, I think we need to realize that we've done a great job so far, but we've really just gotten started. Like we're we're really just at the low hanging fruit. We're doing those things. And if we're gonna keep going up this ex exponential curve where emissions reductions keep getting harder and harder, I think it becomes more and more important that we all kind of work together. So that would be industry and, and government and all the ecosystem that we have here on the stage. Like it, it, it really is becoming more and more challenging as we set loftier and loftier targets and as we, uh, make more and more of an opportunity for Alberta and our energy systems to to go and displace higher emissions energy from around the world. So I would say great job so far, but we've got lots of work left to do. Can I just build on that a little bit? Um, so nothing spurs innovation or invention like a crisis. And I think, uh, you know, what we all recognize, but maybe not articulate as such as the industry for a while now has been under an existential threat. Um, in order for actual survival. Um, there's a reason why Alberta was the first jurisdiction in North America to put a price on carbon. It wasn't out of the goodness of our heart. It was because we were under threat and there was going to be an imposition federally and otherwise on uh, on some, some level of carbon pricing or, or some addressing of carbon. Um, you remember the ducks and the tailings ponds and everything else. That's what, what spurred actually the stomach government at the time to put a, a price on carbon. And I think the industry is astute enough to know that, uh, uh, over time that the the industry has been, you know, under threat given the um, climate uh, challenges that we face and where the world is going, and has chosen to be more proactive in dealing with that in order to ensure its sustainability and thriving into the future, rather than reactive and waiting for you know governments uh, to in impose things that are not going to be economically achievable. And so I think why you're seeing, you've seen collaboration before uh, in the energy industry, but I think this time it's a, it's a whole new ball game and you have governments, funders, technology providers, and the industry, universities and, and others all working together because we know something needs to get done and it's just not one solution. It's going to be a multiple array of approaches and a portfolio approach into the future to mitigate the risks that the the industry is under. Can I just add just one 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 thought on what uh, what Justin just said is, you know, you brought up the foundation of the, of what was then called Esker, which is now the tier system. And I want to talk about how important how that specific system was set up in terms of creating the innovation system. You know, people talk about carbon pricing a lot, and they use that word as if it's interchangeable, but it's really, really important to understand that in Alberta, we have an actionable price signal, okay? So one that really rewards that if you're able to create emission reductions, um, that you're actually able to have a direct price incentive that is payable to the company that is generating those emission reductions or, or the proponent that is doing so. I wanna say that I would say without a doubt, if we didn't have that particular approach, so a market-based, actionable carbon price signal, I don't think we would have the ecosystem of companies, new technologies, um, a regulator that is willing to embrace innovation through the creation of new protocols, new methodologies that are able to quantify and monet allow you to monetize those emission reductions. That is absolutely foundational, I think, into creating the innovation system we have today, as opposed to a tax-based system, which tends to be Again, not a, a, an actionable price signal for technologies. I would say it's really, really important for people to understand that I think it's a really important key to the innovation system here. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll play off that one more step as to like how meaningful that is for other parts of Canada as well. To give to give an example, like Termline's emissions performance in BC is actually better than in Alberta. 
and it, and it's mostly because of the resource base. So so in BC we can have so many fewer wells and so many fewer infrastructure compared to Alberta, where where the resource is a little bit different. It's not the Montney with multiple legs of of horizon. But I can say without a doubt that without the Alberta tier system, we we would not have been able to execute what we executed into BC because those technologies that we developed and learned about and used this incredible ecosystem in order to build, we took those and moved them into BC. And and the BC system is is quite a bit different than the Alberta system. It was much more of a tax based system type of thing, and there wasn't the opportunities to develop there. So you saw this thing where we like a real live example. We developed in Alberta. We built all those companies. We built all those solutions, and then we implemented them across where Termaline operates. So uh, a big kudos to the to the group of people on the stage because that that wouldn't have been able to happen without the Alberta system. I just want to add, I'm going to build on since we're talking about tier, because I think one of the things that you're seeing in energy sector uh, focus right now, but part of the tier system as well includes our offset system. And the advantage, in my opinion, on that the offset system is it actually allows us to innovate and add the technology from other sectors and allow them to come into our market, even though they're not necessarily those that are regulated. And so you're seeing opportunities to expand just beyond the, the, the examples you're hearing today into other sectors like agriculture and transportation. So what I'm hearing is a well-designed policy that does what it's intended to do um, can really trigger investment into industry and really grow um, the, the proponents, but also other technology providers uh, that that help you know further drive with the emission reductions that the policy is meant to do. So, yeah, uh, those are all great comments, and I appreciate everybody building because we're going to run out of questions before we run out of time. Um, and Justin, the the one thing that jumped out of me into your comments was never waste a good crisis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am going to look to the audience if any questions for you guys. Oh, yeah. Do, do we have a mic for audience questions? I didn't give you guys a head, heads up about that one. So we like curveballs. Thanks, Justin. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So uh, great panel. I'm going to pick up on Scott's comment on low hanging fruit. And now it gets tougher. And I'd just like to know what are the most promising technologies? And it's really kind of open to anybody. But where do you see the next Kind of top three opportunities are to go to that next level from the low-hanging fruit that you talked about uh, as far as technologies uh, i think the the detection technologies in the methane space for example are evolving super fast i think i think they're getting more and more interesting as well where we can start to see a lot more things uh, and i'm actually kind of looking forward to that because like right now, if you look from a satellite and you see Canada or Alberta, you see very little emissions or virtually no emissions. And as that keeps expanding, I think that's going to be a good thing for both us to build kind of the business intelligence to to really understand where methane emissions are coming from so that we can all invest in the right things and, and invest in the right technologies. Uh, but I also think it'll be a good thing because it'll be one of the few times where we can actually be compared on an equal measuring stick where Alberta can be compared to the rest of the world and and everyone can see without without a whole bunch of questions or or is are we just reporting properly as to how all the different nations compare to each other. So I'd say that's that's one of the things that I'm excited for. So I, I have the fortunate opportunity to work with a team that that's all we do is look at a 40,000 foot level of the promising technologies that are needing to be invested in in order to accelerate the outcomes we're all looking to achieve. And, you know, things have evolved even since I've been uh, a year a over the past two years, technology is quickly adopting. Obviously, you're seeing further integration of AI, machine learning and digitization in all areas of industrial processing, and that's just going to continue. Um, uh, we've actually recently funded a number of uh, digital companies with uh, AI components in order to enhance process optimization and facilitate um, uh, things like predicting line loss and electricity and so forth. The modernization of the electricity grid is the holy grail of a whole bunch of opportunity that needs to happen, particularly as we're going to increase electrification one way or the other uh, in terms of our development. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit that needs to be addressed in that particular area. Um, I think uh, another uh, important area that we need to be focusing on is advanced carbon capture. Uh, so uh, uh, amine plus or non-amine based uh, carbon capture solutions that reduce costs on, on the capture of uh, CO2 and facilitate uh, more cost-effective CCS opportunities into the future. 
Um, those are a, a few of the key areas. We're looking at a whole spectrum of, of different things, though, in terms of next generation SMRs, small nuclear reactors, um, enhanced geothermal, um, as well uh, as a whole host of energy efficiency technologies uh, in industrial applications. So I, I'm not going to answer that question directly, but I think what I wanted to add to this conversation is about as the policymaker and the regulator, how are we actually taking some of the feedback and what uh, Justin is seeing as an example through a funder of new technology, what are we doing on our end? Um, and so for, for us in, in uh, environment, we're actually looking at our policies. So our uh, CCUS quantification protocol, protocol, for example, and you mentioned capture, um, and that's one of the areas we're looking at. So how do we expand our policy framework so that it can allow some of those new technologies that are on the horizon that we're not maybe necessarily advancing immediately, but we actually have the structure in place so that companies can actually test them and advance them into the into the market. Can I can I just take a, a jump? I, I hoped you would. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to explain an, or use an analogy here. I'm not sure if it's going to work because it's, it's coming out in real time, but, you know, we have the benefit of working across the world. And if I look at the opportunities that and the stuff that we've done on methane mitigation in Alberta specifically, it's easy to think, okay, we've we've used up all the low hanging fruit. I think one of the benefits of having an innovation ecosystem like we have a regulatory framework that really rewards continuous innovation is that it's like, okay, if you think of a tree, you know, you reach up, you grab all the low hanging fruit. If you have an innovation, an innovation ecosystem that is iterative, it's like you keep adding blocks at the bottom of the tree so that you can keep reaching higher up into the tree. And it's not hard. You don't have to jump. The system is able to continuously evolve so that you work your way up the tree. We don't see that in other parts of the world where they're still trying to grasp that first thing at the bottom of the tree because they don't have the platform that is allowing them, allowing them to really work their way up the tree. Again, I don't know if the analogy worked, but hopefully you guys can get what I'm saying. It's really one of the advantages of what Alberta's built. I think that's a great analogy. And the session's recorded, so we can go back and we can get it word for word. <laughs> Nice. I, I might answer the question a little bit more directly than I did before, just because Termly does have a list of priorities on on what we're working on, and looks like we have ten minutes to fill, so I can I can say a little bit about what they are. So our our, our priorities are are based on on a few different things. So we focus on on water recycling, we focus on diesel displacement, we focus on methane, and then we focus on energy efficiency. And they don't quite unpack on their own, so so I can kind of explain. So. From a water recycling point of view, we've been working for some time in order to increase our ability to recycle water. A lot of that is infrastructure based. So having the, the system and the pipelines in order to, to move water around, take it from where you don't want it to be and bring it to where you want it to be. But it's also a little bit of innovation around kind of improving the quality of that water and making it so that it can be reused and so that you don't have to use fresh water. So, so we're at about in BC, for example, we're at about 98% water recycling right now. So that means that of the produced water, we recycle about 98% of it. So that's been big for us and that's something we've been focused on for some time. The next thing that we're, we're really been working on has been diesel displacement. We, we like the idea of using less diesel fuel, using more of our own natural gas and electricity when that's possible. So we've been working on innovation to do that. Again, ERA helped with one of the technologies, but we're, we're using lots of different technologies to do that. We're now at the point where we've displaced more than I'm going to get this wrong, 100 million liters of diesel fuel, which is a pretty cra crazy number when you kind of go all the way through time. And we've done that through things like on, on frack fleets, for example, we use tier four frack fleets, which allow us to use our own natural gas. In Spear River, we have Highline power drilling rigs, so we can plug into the Highline power in, in Alberta and run off purely electric. We built our hybrid drilling rigs that run batteries and, and things like that. And we're displacing diesel fuel and sometimes using companies that, that bring in CNG in order to, to use that instead of diesel fuel. Uh, on the methane space, that's kind of our, that's like our main jam. That's, that's where we kind of do a lot of work Emissions Testing Center will do a little bit of a talk here on Saturday about it, and we can kind of go through everything in that space as well. But I think energy efficiency is really undersold itself. From, from our perspective, that's kind of how we grew up, how we kind of became recognized as a, as a bit of an environmentally friendly company, because we're always focused on energy efficiency, because energy efficiency is capital efficiency, and, and that's incredibly important. But it's given us an advantage or a bit of a leg up when it comes to, to natural gas production. 
And that that's tiny little things like changing valves on compressors that can give you like a 5% improvement on efficiency is really meaningful when it comes to emissions and, and reduction in fuel. Uh, so whether that's those types of things or we've also built, not to keep using the battery pack system, but we were funded by CRIN to, to build a battery pack system in order to make a essentially a Prius uh, gas plant instead of just just having this concept where engines would have to run all the time in order to power the gas plant the engines charge the battery and the gas plant just uses the amount of energy from the battery and it allows us to shut off a lot of engines so those things about energy efficiency aren't the big headline pieces and we do some of the headline things as well so we do some carbon capture we do some work on RNG, we, we do those things as well, but we've really been focused on what we're calling the pillars on the action of today. And that's kind of been where we've been working. Yeah, Scott, I'm glad you brought up efficiency. Um, Cause I think that as, you know, when we talk about things getting harder, it's not just from a technical perspective, but from an investment perspective, they're getting to be bigger and bigger investments. Um, so making investments that make good business sense is gonna be more and more critical. So glad you brought up that, that uh, business efficiency perspective as well. I think we have one more question here. Yes, thank you, Jess. Uh, thanks, first of all, I'm really happy to see Tim, Scott, you guys are from Tourmaline, Atco just now. I'm from myself from Energy, from, I'm from Calgary, from Alberta, on service side of oil and gas. So I, I, be honest with you, I didn't know how much oil and gas companies from Alberta are involved in making the world greener just now. So is, I'm feeling really proud about it. So my question will come, uh, just I will set my question and I'll give some ex explanation to it. How government and private sector in Alberta can better collaborate, uh, I'll say not even better, just kind of accelerate collaboration on uh, implementing green technologies. I'll explain my question. Like, I'm, for example, I work in Calgary. We are an R&D company. We built our new tools. Actually, we run for Turmalin as well. And Turmalin is really great, uh, very conscious. But many EMP companies told me, Jehun, and I, by the way, my name is Jehun. I'm from, from Azerbaijan as well. So I'm, I live in Calgary, but I'm from Azerbaijan. You know, so many EMP companies, leaders told me, Jehun, you should speak more about uh, how our technologies uh, reduces carbon footprint. Same time, when I go to the oil and gas companies in Alberta, for example, they don't have any incentive to use uh, our technologies compared to the uh, opposite technologies because there is no incentive in, uh, exists. You know, there's two ways how we can get greener, get taxes or uh, get the new technologies. I believe the new technologies, but I don't know how can we accelerate this is because the government even does know about it, not just now. Sometimes private companies don't know about it. How this can be really accelerated? What can be done better there just to make sure what we build in Alberta, and we have many good EMP, uh, R&D companies in Alberta, very brilliant engineers, can be green lighted to be implemented, at least in Alberta. I'll start. I used to work for government for a long time, so I kind of know what I'm speaking about in that area too. Um, so we're we're doing it in many ways already, right? Through organizations like uh, Emissions Reduction Alberta and Alberta Innovates, where government is providing funding to the development of these late stage technologies, but just as importantly, sharing the knowledge of what's happening and the challenges of those developments and the regulatory or policy barriers those companies are coming about as they try all these new technologies and then informing government you know this regulation is proving to be problematic because the, it's a and uh, disenabling the adoption of, of this particular technology this might be something to consider in terms of updating or amending a, a particular policy or, or regulation industry's never been shy at working with and talking to government and the Alberta government's never been shy at talking with the industry and all of the best policies that have been developed in the energy space have been developed in collaboration with industry and the government hasn't gone into a silo and and developed it on its own and so it's it's that conti continuous cycle of uh, of feedback of trying something this isn't working this is working how do we amend the structure of the processes the policy regimes or the regulations over time to make it better and there's been constant iterations and tweaking of tier and, and other pieces into the future but uh, it's also the investment that government's putting into these technologies that it's getting that continuous feedback loop of what's working what's not what's preventing scale we just funded 11 ccs uh few feasibility studies in, in the past two years we learned lot through that and we're sharing that information now globally of what what works and what what isn't um if we never had helped fund those feasibilities the companies would have done it on our own or they wouldn't have done it at all and they wouldn't have shared it more broadly necessarily with, with the other sectors so I, I think a lot of this relies on knowledge sharing and trying learning and doing 
Yeah, I think Justin's actually covered most of what I would have said. If you look at the system in Alberta, I think that's what we're set up for is to encourage that. As a policymaker and a regulator, we have to work with industry because we know that they know their technologies and their industry best. So they're going to know what's going to work for them. Um, and I and I think I'll pick up on what Justin said about the evolution part. Like it's a feedback loop constantly. Um, and I don't think we would develop good policy, whether it's on um, green technology or otherwise, if we didn't actually have that engagement and constant collaboration. Um, so I, I don't think there's much more I would add, but I, th I think that's the key piece is that our system, because we have already, it's a, I, I think you use Scott, the carrot and stick, yeah. right? It, uh, um, I, it's not the language I would use, but it's really, it is about uh, sparking the desire to actually invest in technology rather than necessarily penalizing. There's options there for industry to invest. Yeah, and as Yvonne said, we're kind of at that point where we have these building blocks to kind of move to the next step. And I and I, I know the Alberta program very well in order to kind of say what those building blocks are. So what, what you're really speaking of is essentially a drilling and completions protocol where you could use the current system and it, and design a protocol to say for emissions reductions in the drilling and completion space, that there could be a protocol to show when you're reducing emissions that there's some way to get a value back out of that space. So that that would be a good idea. And and luckily, Alberta has a system. You can pitch a protocol to the system, and that's something that that can be worked on and built out. And I I do think I heard Minister Schultz also talk about a a drilling kind of thing that's kind of coming out in the future at the at the previous panel I was just at. So that's another one that to definitely look into to see whether there's places for for you to find opportunities in that that section as well because I, I think your your tools may work in that under that kind of new funding that was just announced thank, thank you so this experience from Turbolino has come. thank you uh before i do the last run through the uh, last question for the panel is there anything else from the audience any other questions seeing none okay uh we'll just pass the mic down one last time uh what's next What's what's next for Alberta? What's the next big challenge? Um, you know, what do we have to tackle in terms of the innovation ecosystem, and uh, you know, what's ahead of us? So that's a that's a big load of question, and I think just in, uh, in terms of trying to be succinct here, I think one of the things we're going to really have to continue to do is prioritize uh, where we focus our energies in terms of getting projects to final investment decision, uh, in terms of uh, doing as, as much as we can on the emissions reduction front while maintaining competitiveness of the economy. So there, there's a few areas where we've generated some real global leading expertise, and we have to uh, drill on, on that, um, share that with the globe, but find ways to execute on a, a number of these big projects. We've already seen uh, a few big final investment decisions on, on some bigger uh, mission reduction projects. Uh, I think we're gonna have to spend the next couple of years making sure uh, we get further down that uh, train of final investment decision, but that it's resilient enough um, to withstand a, a, a variety of changed policy and political circumstances uh, around greenhouse gas emissions into the future, because I think we're embarking on a very different world than we were, say, last year. Um, Alberta Energy Province, blessed with resources, but I would build on and just echo Justin's comment about how we bring things to market. And, and for us, that's about de-risking and helping to de-risk by continuing that funding um, and, and support the capital part. I think that the, the advantage of some of the funding programs and investment programs that are available in Alberta help industry to access uh, capital or startups to access capital that may not necessarily be available otherwise. And now we need to push to actually get it to finalization. Um, and we have to keep we have to keep adapting. And so the only way we're going to be able to continue adapting is to actually try out different technology and continue to innovate and support that innovation. Um, and I think that uh, the last thing is, is that how do you focus your priorities at the same time? How do you try out uh, different things? We talked about hydrogen, we talked about geothermal, and we have to look, I think we have to be looking at all of those things. I think one of the questions you were going to ask me today, Tim, <clears throat> that we didn't get a chance to, I'm going to try to tackle it here because I think it's really important. We're in an international forum here. And if we just talk about, you know, the great things we're doing in Alberta and we're not 
sharing those or taking those outside of Alberta, we're missing a huge opportunity. And so for us as a company, I want to maybe tie, you know, some of the stuff that, that Tourmaline has talked about uh, and how we've, we've taken what we've learned in Alberta and taken it international. So, um, you know, a, a big part of what we do on the technology side of our business is about um, building tools that provide full integrity and accountability around emission reductions and emission reductions claims. And so we've been able to take tools that we've developed and worked on first on a pneumatics program that we executed in Alberta. So Ryan Arsenal, our CEO and myself, we're really proud to work with 42 different oil and gas companies. I think we replaced over 12,000 pneumatic devices from 2017 to 2020. I think part of the results of that program became part of one of the, the foundational pillars that helped Alberta hit that uh, first, I think it was a 25% reduction methane emissions uh, by 2025, I think it ended up being about 13% of that goal. But what did we learn through that and how have we applied this globally? We were able to take some of that same technology um, that helped solve pneumatics emissions around methane and we're applying it to cook stove projects in Southeast Asia. So that technology of how do you meter, how do you measure the pieces of equipment that are spread, thousands of pieces of equipment um, across multiple places, places where there's no cell phone access. How do you meter it? How do you measure it? How do you ensure that it's actually real? We're actually doing that with cook stoves. Um, it's one of the most important project types in the world in the voluntary carbon market. Well, we took expertise technology that we developed in Alberta and we're applying it globally. But I would say that one of the most important things that Alberta needs to do that we need to take globally is the attitude of moving at the speed of the problem. So the fact that Alberta's actually hit 52% methane, uh, a, a reduction of 52% in methane emissions from 2016, and we've been able to do that by 2024. Methane is the largest global priority for emission reductions. We haven't just talked about it for the last year, eight years, we've actually gotten it done. The entire world moved at that same speed, tackling methane, I tell you, we would be on a much different trajectory than we are right now. That's what Alberta needs to show and tell. We can't just tell our story, you know, in Alberta. We need to share that, moving at the speed of the problem, not being worried about making mistakes, getting it done. That's really, really important. That's the story we need to tell internationally. Yeah, and I, I agree completely. I, I think we kind of said this get or done thing that Alberta has, and I think we need to keep doing that. Um, we kind of have this concept of, taking good steps in the right direction and and then see how far we've come. And and I think the 52% achievement that we've had really shows that when you when you just get focused on getting it done, take the steps in the right direction and, and kind of see where you come when it's all said and done, you can achieve pretty incredible things. So I'd say that that would be kind of one of the big things that I say we got to that we have to keep doing uh, and just not arguing about what 2050 may or may not look like in the future, but just focus on there are emissions, reduce them, let's get it done and, and keep improving. And then at, at the same time, start working on some of the moonshots. So the carbon captures, the renewable natural gases, the hydrogen, the, those those kind of moonshots at the same time, we keep investing in them, keep working on them, and, and we keep doing those. But I, but I really want to say it's about getting it done and taking those steps in the right direction, because it, it is continuous improvement that's going to get us there at the end. And arguing about which emission reductions are right or wrong really isn't helping anything. Let's just reduce some emissions and, and keep moving in that direction and see, see where we get to when it's all said and done. Yeah. Awesome. So that concept of continuous improvement, um, continuing to put down those blocks at the bottom of the tree, right. To get the, the higher and higher fruit that those blocks are going to be made up of, of attitude, ingenuity, uh, expertise, good policy, and also the support from, from funders to continue pushing all that forward. But uh, I agree for sure, this is a story that needs to be told uh, you know, far and wide. I, there's a great contingent of folks here from Alberta that are telling the story in different forums. So we've got to keep that up, but I yeah, appreciate everybody for joining today, for sharing those insights and look forward to doing this again next year. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks.